place and reuse plastic bags with eco-friendly reusable bags that feature advertising from sustainable brands on them. And tapping into that desire to reuse and, and be more sustainable, consumers can reuse our bags and using our app can earn rewards that they can then spend back on the sustainable brands that we advertise. So quite interesting little, you know, uh, tie in with the sustainability side of what you guys are interested in as well, but also from the tech side, um, you know, that we built our entire platform, we built an app. I never thought I'd end up in a tech startup, um, and now that I'm here, I realise that it's not as big and scary as maybe um, maybe everyone thinks it is. So, as I already mentioned, this uh, this survey was launched in partnership with uh, Women in Tech. So, I am the UK ambassador for Women in Tech, which is an amazing community that focuses on closing the gender gap in um in the tech industry and they're doing some really really amazing things so if you are someone who's interested in this space if you are a woman looking to get into tech or looking to change your career or maybe you're kind of already in there and you want to mentor or be be involved please do check them out they're doing some really really exciting things um but yeah no i, I really really am excited to talk to everyone today i think that um what's really lovely being in the role that I'm in right now and, and my involvement in the community is seeing all these amazing women coming through really trying to you know challenge the way things are being done and having these conversations about where the difficulties are I think is the first step to addressing them. Thank you Ashley and um, if I could invite Raf to share introduce yourself that'd be great. Oh thank you for having me Viola. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here to share my journey with everyone. <laughs> so I am Rav Bumbra. I have worked in the tech industry for about 25 years now um, as a consultant. Ten years of that time has been spent in technology recruitment where I developed a passion for making progress on gender equality. Seeing the lack of women around me meant that I had to go and do something about it. So in 2015, I set up my first business, Structured People, which uh, helps leaders and executives set up their diversity strategies and helps companies attract and retain women in tech. Around the same time, I found myself talking to many women who are facing many barriers. And I really want to understand the challenges that they faced when entering the, the tech industry. Um, between 2016 and 2018, we conducted many um, some research and ran some initiatives which were hugely successful in London. Um, so that led me to set up my second business in 2018, which is Kajigo. Um, it's the world's first mentoring app supporting girls and women <coughs> into STEM and technology careers. And we are on track to support 20,000 girls across UK schools over the next year. So before the end of 2023, which I'm delighted to say is working so well and we're having a huge impact <coughs> in helping young girls progress, not in, just into the tech industry, but also teaching them the foundations of business, which is very, very important that we spill that over into this next generation. Um, I'm also an advisor to businesses. I sit on a couple of boards, um, the Women in uh, Business Board and also the Education Task Group in Bristol to make progress for women in the Southwest region. And finally, I'm host of an Instagram live chat show, which airs every Monday evening called Women Talk Tech. It's been running for 18 months. I get to talk to a variety, uh, uh, lots of different women who work in a variety of roles in technology across industries, sharing their strategies for success, leadership lessons and um, aiming to help more women um, break into the tech industry. Thank you, Rob. And if I may, Zoe, can I invite you to introduce yourself to our audience? Yeah. Hi, Viola, and hello to everyone who's joining today. Mm -hmm. So um, my area of passion and specialty is leadership and communications, or leadership and storytelling, if you like. So you know, how can we lead in our context and how can we engage and inspire others to be part of transformational change? Uh, most recently, I've created uh, the third online course that I've created for Cambridge, where I'm a fellow, and that is a course called Women Leading Change, Shaping Our Future. So it was wonderful to be able to do a deep dive, specifically looking at the dynamics of women's leadership. And that came actually partly the inspiration for that was a course that I've run the last couple of years working with Emirati women in Dubai and seeing how powerful it is when women can get together as a community to support each other to build capability and confidence. So my background is that I've got a long career in, um, 
business. I was managing director of global consultancies, also worked in-house uh, as director of communications and sustainability for British Telecom um, BT Retail. Um, and uh, did a master's in sustainability leadership at Cambridge when I was quite old. So I, I've learned the value of education, um, but my focus is very much on, you know, what are the pragmatic tools that we need to lead change? So lovely to be here, Viola. Thank you, Zoe. And now if I could come to you, Irene, and please to introduce yourself to our audience. Yeah. Hi, Viola, thank you, and hi, everyone. My name is uh, Irene Maffini, and my background is um, working and investing in sustainability startups. So I've done this for almost 12 years. And I have to say that the first half of my career had very few female founders. Uh, um, historically, I guess, sustainability, more called like clean tech, has focused on a lot of energy businesses or, uh, you know, kind of, um, and there have been not many women, but in the last few years, I've been focusing much more on uh, circular economy and actually sustainable fashion more recently. And it's actually very nice to see many more female founders in uh, these sectors. I'm also part of two angel groups uh, called Hermesa and Alma. They specifically focus on uh, supporting female founders. And I think uh, there are more of these uh, uh, groups or funds that focus in this area. This is also something that I witnessed changing in the last couple of years. And um, so I look forward to the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now, the last but not the least, Freddie, could you introduce yourself as well? Thank you. Of course. Thank you so much. It's so lovely to be here with you all. So I am Freddie. I currently have an awful cold, so please forgive my slightly strange voice. Um, I'm the founder of POP, which is a mindset and performance coaching practice for venture investors and for entrepreneurs. I've always been fascinated by human potential and outlier behaviours and work with very high performing individuals to help them elevate their sense of uh, impact but also fulfillment and energy. Um, prior to coaching I used to build teams of venture investors so I did a huge amount of work around improving diversity in this still very homogenous industry and specifically around increasing the proportion of women. Uh, there's obviously still a very long way to go but things are starting to move in the right direction and um, I'm excited to be here with you all and have this conversation so thank you so much for having me. Thank you all for the quick introduction. So now, before I share the part one result of the survey, uh, just a reminder, if anyone have any questions, please uh, do put your questions into the chat function. Our colleague will be monitoring that, and we will try our best to answer as many as possible in the final Q&A time. Now, let me just see if I am able to share my screen. So. Can everyone see my screen? Okay, <clears throat> great. Now, so talking about this survey, um, the survey data, we launched it, as I mentioned, on the 7th of March, and we run it till the 31st of March. In total, there are 82 people participated in the survey, and majority of them, so around 80% of participants are from the UK, and more than 90% of them are sole founders or co-founders in a business. In this survey, we also ask about participants, their industry and sectors, and how long they have been an entrepreneur. So we are able to cross-analyze the different metrics. So in part one, we have asked, to what extent do you fear your gender has impacted your business journey in terms of fundraising, business development, and, sec and so on? For, so according to the survey the stats, <clears throat> what we find out is that gender has the most negative impact, and the area will be the fundraising, and followed by investors' relationship management. Interestingly, the stats also shows that being a female founder seems to have a positive impact on you know, recruitment or managing teams. So these stats are similar across different sectors. So there is no significant difference between industries. So now I <clears throat> would like to uh, just pause this survey for the time being and then to ask um, um, Ralph, because as the female uh, founder yourself, are you surprised at this result of the survey? Does this align with your own experience? 
Um, well, I'm not surprised at all. I have to say, we we hear this and we've heard it for you know a long time, um, and it seems as if we're, it's a broken record, right? Um, even when we did our own research with stretched people in 2016, we heard the same story from female founders. Um, so I don't know if many people have read the Rose Review came out a few weeks ago. Um, Alison Rose um, did say that if women started businesses at the same rate as men, we would add 250 billion to the UK economy. So we know it's a great time to start and scale a business, yet we know that gender equality is holding women back. And when you start looking at that whole gender piece, what is it that holds women back? <laughs> and I'd like to say from my own experiences, I was quite late to the entrepreneurial journey. I started in my late 40s. And, you know, when you look at gender stereotypes, for example, you know, most women wouldn't start a business in their late 40s because that's when you would have already started to scale up your business and our investors going to take you seriously. So I'm already starting my entrepreneurial journey on the wrong footing according to some. Um, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to be harder for me to get investor funding, but be taken seriously as a female founder. Um, but I, I would say that it's, it's been a very difficult road. Entrepreneurship is a roller coaster of a ride. Every day is very different and you have to be very strong, motivated and determined to get through it. Um, but let's look, at, let's look at all the problems that women are trying to solve. We need women to solve these problems. We are solving half of the world's problems. And at this moment in time, men are dominating this space. So look at all the solutions that <coughs> investors and VCs are missing out on. There's so much gain to capitalize on right at this moment in time. So I would say where, where I've actually seen some challenges myself is not being taken seriously when I've gone into a meeting and I've talked about my product or my business. And I sometimes wonder if I had a male co-founder, would that conversation take a different route automatically? Um, I, I see a lot of female founders approach me and say, you know, they know of, of a male founder who has got investment, even though he hasn't even got an MVP. It's just an idea. You know, how is that even possible? Um, and so then you say to yourself, is it because men network differently to women? <laughs> you know, we do have this issue about networking, but also do they have access to better mentors? Do they have access to a brotherhood that we don't know about? So there's lots of factors, I think, that present us with challenges. And um, when, when we don't have access to these networks, to these mentors, we really don't get access to funding. And we know that historically mm -hmm. women don't have access to much funding. So we have to work much, much harder. Um, and I'd also like to say that it has been difficult for women to break into business, but I think the pandemic has really escalated things. So if we start to look at women taking up the majority of work at home, it means that they're whole, they've been held back as well from moving their businesses forward. So I think in terms of the results of this survey, when it comes to funding, it's, it's very difficult for women and we need to look at new ways to provide that access into funding for women, um, but also that business development pathway. Um, how can they scale up that business? Who's working with them to, to help them expand that business outwards? Thank you, Rob. <clears throat> Thank you for sharing with us your kind of personal journey as well as uh, how you feel about being a female uh, entrepreneur. So we have <clears throat> one of the comments um, that was in the survey, and it says, I was rejected by an investor because of my male co-founder left. He wasn't a technical co-founder, but it was just assumed that he was why I wrote my codes and managed to take big. So I would like to come to um, Ashley, because you are a UK ambassador for women in tech. So looking at you know, comments like this, what role do you think um, you know, groups like uh, women in tech can really kind of play that support role to uh, support female founders to overcome like challenges like this? 
Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I actually just want to kind of come back to something that, that Rav touched on as well around this idea of community and network and who you go to to ask questions, to get that mentorship, to get the right introduction as well. Because I think that, you know, community is a huge factor in opening up the doors for for women in every space whether you're a founder or whether you're looking to get into a leadership role or whether you're looking to get into break into more traditionally male areas of work right so i think what's wonderful about you know communities like women in tech is it feels like firstly it's it's intended to provide a safe space because i don't know about you guys but certainly if you feel like you're the only woman in the room you know, you feel like you can't always ask the stupid question because there's already a glaring light on you. If you're, you, you already feel like you're having to work 10 times harder than the men around the table to prove that you deserve to be there. So you don't necessarily always feel like you can ask the silly question in case you get found out, right? Typical imposter syndrome. I'm gonna get found out, I don't, I shouldn't be here. With something like a group like Women in Tech, you have a safe space to ask those silly questions and to be like, sorry, there's this acronym and I, I have no idea what that means. Can someone talk me through that? Can someone show me how to use this piece of tech? Is there a way that I can make this run more efficiently? So just that safe space where you can ask those questions and improve you know, your own understanding. So when you are in those rooms, maybe you just feel a bit more confident. You just feel like you've had the opportunity to ask without having to do it in a place that maybe doesn't make you feel that confident. They also open up opportunities in terms of, you know, mentorship, connecting with like minded people, you know, having that sort of desire to get into a space like tech. It's not marketed at women. Well, as I said, I was I never thought I'd end up in tech. Absolutely not. I thought, you know, I'll end up in a marketing role or whatever, the kind of role that's typically OK for women to go into. But actually tech is a huge industry and there's so many different roles that you can do to get into it so trying to make it more available and put those resources out there so people could start to understand it's not just some bro world where people are sitting in their you know <laughs> sitting behind a screen tapping code that's what we all assume it is tech is fascinating it's everything that we do on a day-to-day -day basis we know tech we just don't think that we do so having access to those resources, understanding it, talking to like-minded people in a really safe environment is, is really exciting. Um, and then as, you know, again, just touching on something that, that Rav said about that kind of brotherhood that I think a lot of guys kind of lean on, that, that kind of boys club, you know, who can I talk, oh, mate, can I, can, do you know anyone that can help me with this? We don't have that, it's not been established. So can those kind of new networks, places like women in tech, those communities, can they sort of provide that for us as we start to build our careers? Can we sort of open up the opportunities for other women around us and, and be that for each other and continue to use our growth and our success and our opportunities to open up the same for other women? And I think that that is what is gonna be really, really key is us as women working together to really help elevate women in these spaces rather than being forced to see each other as competition, which is kind of where we're pushed into at the moment. Thank you, Ashley. <clears throat> so now if we are um, looking at the result, the founders center seems to impact their fundraising and kind of investor relationship the most. So based on <clears throat> there were some quotes and um, because they are so powerful, so I really would like to share with you. Um, please let me know if you are able to see that. <clears throat> so oops. an investor told me he does invest in women but I have to prove to him that I will work as hard as men. That's um, kind of one of the quotes from the survey. And other ones also, I think, um, Ralph, you mentioned very similar things. They don't necessarily have an MVP or some sort, but because they are male-led companies, has less traction, but then they got investments. And so let me just stop sharing. <clears throat> I want to come to you, um, Irina, because you are kind of represent the investors and obviously as an angel investor yourself and you are also in like two female angel groups. So what's your view on this? <clears throat> Is it really this bad as well as um, have there some changes in the investor communities? Um, can you share with us? Yeah. Yeah, I have to say that when I saw some of these quotes and I think you presented, you know, 
you know, some of them and some were actually quite, you know, shocking to me in terms of, you know, there was a particular investor telling to a female founder that, um, you know, he doesn't invest in women businesses because women are too emotional. And that is, you know, it is quite shocking to hear that people would even make such comments these days. And I think for me, the kind of biggest problem still at the moment is, is that there are not enough uh, female investors, especially being, who are partners in some of the largest venture capital funds. Um, so it's, um, you know, even, uh, and, and this is, you know, kind of slowly changing, but uh, even, uh, you know, I understand that uh, in terms of how a VC works with a GPLP structure, there is in some funds they are now adding, you know, the possibility of partners to take uh, maternity leave because that was not something that they originally actually put in, you know, in how the fund contracts work. So it, it is, you know, for me, it's a big problem. And uh, I'm part of two angel groups uh, called Alma and Hermes, and that were born to actually, with a big mission to bring more female investors to the table for, uh, and also to support more female founders, of course. And uh, in particular, like uh, Alma, which is now, I think, the largest community um, is 300 or so angels who want to support female founders. It's a very uh, diverse and large community from first time angel investor to actually experienced fund managers. There are like a few partners in established kind of venture capital funds. And it was started by um, a few people, including Dipali and Gia, who's now partner Speed Invest. Um, and recognizing that there was, you know, a problem as well in the, the kind of decision making stage that is, you know, blocking deals kind of going through. Um, so I guess in, a, you know, as part of the, you know, these sort of com kind of community bubbles, I see, you know, things kind of like changing. I definitely feel like that when female founders reach out to female investors, even if a deal is not for them, they would be uh, quite, uh, you know, helpful in connecting them to different investors, what, you know, Ashley point of, you know, going into sort of, you know, an old boys clubs and, I don't know, like old girls kind of clubs or, you know, and, and I also think the males that are part of these networks are the kind of minority, but they also try to be more helpful because they recognize this is a problem. Um, there was an interesting uh, study by done by DocSend, which if you're not familiar with, is a software tool that enables people to share pitch decks and also monitor what people are doing with them in terms of who looks at them, how long they spend on specific slides. And they actually found out that uh, uh, people, investors spend much more time on, uh, you know, on slides, on the team slide, if this was actually all females. And then they spend more time actually looking at slides like the product slide, because, uh, you know, a woman usually needs to show much more uh, traction or has, you know, investors might show that they are less confidence, especially if it's not a tech you know, someone coming from a tech background, being able to build a successful tech product without having kind of a male founder. So being, you know, seeing this type of results is actually, um, you know, uh, it, it's quite sad, but at the same time, I think that's how things are um, at the moment. But then I think there was also some uh, recent statistics from um, uh, Pitch Book that show that actually, um, teams that have both female and male founders have now attracted 25% on of venture capital uh, funding, which is, you know, it, it is kind of growing in, um, in the right direction. And we've seen, I guess, kind of Halma and Hermesa. So um, Hermesa has supported, I think, around 16 companies raising 600K and Alma has supported around 80 companies raising kind of 4 million. So these are still kind of small realities, but they're new and they're growing. Um, and I think it's, uh, you know, they're not the only one, I think, under other angel groups in the UK, the focus female founders are EVE, Angel Academy, which I believe was the first one. So I think, uh, you know, the UK Business Angel Association is doing a lot of work. So I, you know, I kind of feel positive the things will change, but, you know, a lot uh, needs to happen, I think, in, in the background, supporting women, uh, you know, and some of these issues that you'll be discussing today. Thank you. It definitely feels a shift um, in kind of the industry, but still there's a lot need to be done in order to really achieve that kind of balance. So let's not forget about the positive impact this survey also shows, because they mentioned, uh, you know, being a woman seems to have also positive impact on 
recruitment or managing teams. This very much kind of aligned with the survey done last year by McKinsey and the um, LinkedIn org that women in workplace. Um, 423 organizations found that women leaders more consistently ensure the manageable workloads for their teams, provided the emotional support and check-in and kind of um, overall well-being um, than men. So let me come to you, Zoe. <clears throat> as an educator, you are also passionate, as you mentioned, leadership and communication. So in your view, what do you think need to be done to shift and transform the industry to be more um, friendly towards women? Yeah. Um, thank, thanks for the question, Viola. I think it's it first is it is worth acknowledge, acknowledging that there are many toxic work cultures that are difficult, not just for women, but also for men you know, in terms of how we bring ourselves to work. Um, and I think firstly, you know, let's not be naive. You know, we, we are operating in a patriarchy and dealing with institutions that are structurally designed by men um, and we know this in sort of the data data world in particular so you know firstly I think it's like having real clarity around what are the challenges and the barriers so that we're not naive and secondly where are the levers for change and then thirdly what's what's the size of the prize um, when women are truly able to contribute you know the societal benefit is massive um, and when so I think that you know that's the, the contextual piece. And when it comes to creating industries that are friendly for women, um, I would absolutely say, you know, it, it starts with us. It's like how do we build cultures that are psychologically safe for everybody, you know, that are truly inclusive, that foster collaboration, experimentation, innovation. Um, and then how do we walk the talk? Um, particularly, you know, we're, we're all all role models. So how do we build our own individual capability and confidence and courage to drive change? Um, because leadership is at in any, every context and at all levels of an organisation. So if you're in HR, you can be looking at how can we have more women, more inclusive, friendly work policies and practices. You know, if you're on the shop floor, it's how do we ensure that innovative new ideas bubble up. Um, so I think it's transformation in terms of organizations absolutely starts with ourselves. Thank you, that's very powerful. And so just one, I think it, it, it actually uh, linked to Freddie, your work. So as a mindset and performance coach, you work with a lot of entrepreneurs as well as investors. So what, what would you suggest is there any like practical like tips and things um, our female entrepreneurs, founders can do to kind of help them through those challenges? Yeah, <clears throat> of course. I think I'd really echo what Zoe shared in many ways, because I think if we think about the big challenges that have come up today around relationship management with investors and fundraising, from a mindset perspective, confidence is so important. I think given that only, I think, 2.4% of venture backed businesses are led by female founders in the US and under 1% in Europe, it's a tiny statistic. And so if there aren't that many female role models or people that look like you and act like you, that you can look at and aspire towards, you are the trailblazer. Every single woman who gets venture funding is a trailblazer. And so mentally, the barriers to entry are going to be much higher. And so that self-confidence, courage, conviction is completely essential. I think also going into this, knowing that it's going to be challenging. I think having that, embracing yourself with that feeling of you are going to face a lot of rejection. And it's that old saying, like, if you know you're going to be rejected 100 times, what do you do? You just get through them as quickly as you can and take the lessons and move forwards. And so getting comfortable with that um, and seeing the kind of the no's and the rejection as part of the process is really important. And the second piece also if we uh, builds on what Zoe was sharing about, it starts with us. We can focus on like what we can control. And today, right now, we can't control the systemic biases or the lens through which investors see the world, um, what they're looking for specifically, and actually whether they say yes, we cannot control that. But what you can control is how you show up, how you communicate, the learnings you take from every single conversation you have, from every pitch you do. 
And ultimately, like relationships and fundraising are about value exchanges. It's a value exchange between two parties. And so as an entrepreneur, it's your creative challenge and responsibility to communicate your value proposition in a way that um, they can hear and to explain your vision in a way that aligns with the interests of the human that's in front of you. And so if it's venture funding that you're seeking, um, my advice would be to ask for feedback after every single pitch so that you can continue to refine how you can communicate your value to um, to like lean on your network. And exactly as Ashley was saying earlier, it's like elevate other people around you. It's going to be hard like raising funds it's just it's going to be a challenge but as you take learnings then help other people around you bring them up with you so I think my two kind of mindset pieces would be confidence and conviction is one muscle to build and then the second piece is around controlling what you can control and constantly iterating thank you that's um, quite quite a lot for us to think of what we can do definitely starting from ourselves so thank you for all the tips Freddie so now, um, before I share this part two survey result, just a reminder, if you have any questions, please do put uh, into the LinkedIn chat function. So we will be answering questions uh, at, towards the end of the webinar. So now I am going to share again the survey <coughs> results. Hope you can see it okay. So we have also asked, as a female entrepreneur and founder, uh, indicated to extend to which you find each of the following skills challenging. So that's from self-confidence, risk-taking, and as well as like work-life balance. So according to our stats, <clears throat> the most challenging ones is the uh, work-life balance. But then female founders or co-founders actually have very high motivations. So we try to cross <clears throat> analyze the result with the sectors as well as how long our these entrepreneurs have been an entrepreneur and operating, and there is no significant difference in between them. So now, if I may just come back to you, Freddie. So let me stop sharing. So you can see the faces. Um, I would like to come back to you, Freddie. We all know the pandemic has been impacting people's life. And many comments from the survey actually mentioned about, you know, with lockdown, childcare and homeschooling are just really challenging for, for them. I mean, obviously here is a female, but obviously I believe it's challenging for most of parents. And for my personal feeling, there are kind of two parts to these challenges. One is that obviously the actual physical workload, you know, like childcare and, and homeschooling. But then there is also the other part, it's very much on the mindset part. So as a working mom, I do often feel guilt not, like, you know, not spending enough time with my son, for example. So as a coach, is there any tips that you have in, in terms of tackling this type of mindset side of the challenges for our female founders? Yeah, of course. It's an amazing question. I think the first piece is this expectations versus reality paradigm that as an entrepreneur, you take on such a big responsibility. And if you go into that paradigm with the view that you can do it all, you can be this high flying entrepreneur and you can be the perfect partner, the perfect parent, the perfect friend, the perfect gym, human, whatever. Like it's it's an impossible task that you're setting yourself up for. And so it's that old phrase of you can have everything you want, just not at once. And so that priority pecking order um, of just being really honest with yourself about what A, are your priorities and B, are you owning them? Um, and then seeking support where you need it. So whether that's hiring more people or around you to support you, whether that's in your family, having very candid conversations about what your role is, what your partner's role is, what your parents' role is, what your caregiver's role is, like creating the infrastructure around you to support you as effectively as you can. And if it's not perfect yet, it's like, okay, creating a plan to work towards more support and then in the meantime being kind to yourself about what you can expect from yourself and what you can't so you're not constantly kind of context switching between things and the second piece is on mindset around this guilt that so many parents experience about not spending enough time with their children and especially women and it's because that's like the paradigm that we live in at the moment but the question I'd ask you is how does it benefit your child's life that you aren't there all the time? And so to start to explore the other side of that story. And there are so many gifts that you not being there physically all the time will give your child. And so that could be anything from 
seeing you as an independent working mother is a huge gift and it demonstrates what is possible and it breaks this paradigm of what you should be doing and how much time you should be spending with your child and I know I had two full time like working parents and I had an incredible working mum and for me in my own life I found that very inspiring and she was one of the only mums out of my friends that worked and so I have that from my own life experience but equally it gives your partner an opportunity to step up and share or it means that the child has an opportunity to build bonds with other people in nurseries or family members or caregivers and so stretch their emotional intelligence stretch their resilience stretch their learning stretch their exposure there are so many gifts that come from you not physically being present even if you're creating the dynamics of support around them so it's almost like challenging that in your mind that that would be the question that i would suggest people ask themselves and keep playing until you, you find yourself balancing because ultimately the more inspired that you are by your life the more inspired your child will be too because you're a happier parent you're higher functioning you're contributing more there's so many gifts that you can bring um so that's what i would suggest thank you very much freddie that is really for, for, even for myself it's so powerful to hear this and thank you for sharing with us and so if i may um i actually uh, zoe i will come to you next you as you mentioned earlier to our audience that um you are also like a leading um kind of uh, online online training programs for Cambridge University and women leading change love the title and um, so it was mentioned um in post syndrome uh, was mentioned in in the comments from the surveys so do you, do you have some I know tips or suggestions for our founders how to overcome they feel like they have these imposter syndromes can you share with us yeah yeah and, and firstly i just wanted to respond to what freddie said there because i think it's really powerful i've always been a working mum you know I, I i had my first child in san francisco i was working with dot com companies and at the time you went back to work when your child was 11 weeks old and i think i'm a better mother because i've always been a working working mother and i'm always thinking about how can i how can i role model for my daughters you know what that looks like in all its ugly authenticity and vulnerabilities and mistakes and moving forward so so just on that point um yeah i think when when it comes to to education i mean firstly educating yourself is i would say the number one gift you can give yourself we all know on a macro level that educating women and girls is the most powerful lever for change that we have in the world um so and that starts with us and i i think just just recognizing that we're not alone when we have those feelings um there's a coach called kathy uh, capriano who says the most challenging barrier preventing women reaching their full capability is the ability, inability to recognize their own special talents, abilities, and gifts. Now, it's not just your survey, and there was a recent survey from KPMG, which said 75% of women experience imposter syndrome. So, so what do we do about that? You know, let's build our self-awareness. There are lots and lots of tools out there to really help us understand you know, what kind of person am I? What are my what are my strengths? What are my areas for growth? We've talked about support groups. And there are people like Freddie who who can can coach and and support as well. You know, I've I've got a, a coach and I find that incredibly helpful in terms of giving me perspective. There are also, of course, courses like Women Leading Change, and the benefit of those is you are part of a community of learning. You know, we all need to constantly learn and unlearn and, and relearn and actually doing that alongside others i think is really powerful because we can learn so much from other people's insight and i, I think just echoing what other people have said being kinder to ourselves you know per perfect perfection is the enemy of the good we need to take more risks we need to re reframe failure. And I think the final point I think I'd, I'd, I'd mention, which is building our awareness, is there are some distinct limiting habits and beliefs that women hold more than men. There's a great book called How Women Rise that looks at the um, classic one is how we minimize ourselves. Firstly, with language, you know, we often apologize for what we say or you know we feel like we need to be given permission and then we do that with our body language as well there's a, there's a brilliant anecdote of 
people in a meeting in the old days when we had face-to-face -face meetings and latecomers were coming in, the women are scrunching themselves up trying to accommodate the latecomers and the men just nod at them. No, so let's not minimize ourselves both with our language, um, both our verbal and language. Um, and I think the final point here is all of the contributors for our Women Leading Change course and contributors from all around the world, all different lived experience, when, when asked what they would have done differently, they all said, be bolder and ask for more. And I think it's, you know, if that feels difficult, think about who's, who is walking on your shoulders. You know, change perception by thinking about what you're asking for is, is what is that making possible for others? And ask yourself, where can I unique difference? Because I think if you're, if you're living and working and acting from a space of your values and your purpose, that's really gonna energize you and it will encourage you to be bold and brave and go for more. So a few thoughts there, Viola. Thank you very much. I'm sure our audience will benefit a lot from listening to you know your your, your thoughts shared with us. And so conscious with time, <clears throat> if I may just come back to kind of uh, the investor side, um, Irina. So can you offer a few kind of practical tips for our female founders now with more and more kind of more female themed you know funds or grants or different type of a funding source out there. Do you have some practical tips that you can um, share with our female founders, how they can try and then going forward and find a better way to get investment? Yeah. So I think that in general, like nowadays, it's easier to actually find uh, at least kind of online the names of uh, female investors, uh, being these kind of angel investors or uh, you know, investment associate, principal partners in venture capital funds. So, for example, I know SIF did uh, publish recently, I think, a list of 300 angel invest, female angel investors in Europe that supports kind of female founders. Plus, there are like these communities. So, I think reaching out directly to all the communities as well as the angel groups of business schools, which tend to be quite diverse and international, is definitely good, but also using then you know, LinkedIn as a tool to reach out directly to some of the investors that are part of these groups, especially if you know they are interested or they're active in that particular, you know, technology area that you are playing in. Um, and also, some, actually, I, something that I see the female founders do much more than male founders is that they uh, send investor updates uh, to you know all of the investors they speak to and I imagine especially the ones that said you know no or you know you're too early at this stage just to kind of you know be on the top of their mind and also it is quite impressive to be honest being on the other side receiving the newsletters and seeing how kind of proactive an investor can be and how you know and, and seeing the tractions that they are getting over time especially if uh, you know it was a company that initially was um, you know, not maybe kind of taken seriously internally. And, uh, you, you know, I can uh, I can think about a few times that I found myself in, in this area in the past. Um, and then I think another, I guess, kind of tip or, again, you know, from what I've seen uh, that maybe female founders do a little bit different to male founders is the, um, I think uh, they are more conservative in their financial projections. Uh, and they tend to be a little bit more uncomfortable when talking about money or they don't talk about money as much as a male founder would be. It's very often to see male founders, you know, they haven't done any research. They don't have an MVP telling you how they're going to build a company with 200 million revenues by year three. Uh, and they're going to be, you know, a unicorn company with nothing. Um, but they, they will tell you that. And then you see, I see, you know, female founders, we've actually they have done quite a lot in terms of already, you know, our revenue generating, they know their customers really well, they have, you know, really amazing plans on how they, uh, you know, they will make it work and the other company, they actually have very conservative financial projections. So if you're speaking to a venture capital investor that, you know, they're looking for the unicorn company, you need to show like a financial projection with a hockey stick approach, you know, 100 millions by year five. Uh, and, you know, and, and usually female founders focus on uh, essentially preventing the financial projection. They know 
almost 100% probability they will achieve and they won't, you know, put the whole story. Um, because I think, I guess, uh, historically, it seems that they suffer more from kind of the imposter syndrome. So they feel more uncomfortable telling a, a kind of high growth story. But because all male founders do, then they are the ones that actually manage then to raise funding with um, very little but kind of like an idea. So I think this, I guess, would be sort of my kind of top two kind of tips for, for female founders. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So we have around 10 minutes left and I think there were a couple of questions um, coming in. So I'm going to uh, just sort of questions uh, at our panelists first before if we have more time and then we can share a bit more on the other parts. So one of the questions from uh, our audience were asking, female founders are branded as nice or motherly rather than focusing on those skills in teamwork and collaboration. How can we help or educate people that these characteristics are what people want and need? How can we educate others? So <clears throat> I don't know if uh, our two female founders, do you have experienced similar things that like when you go out to talk to people about your business and your re the responses that you get, oh, that's a nice project. I think we have these comments uh, from a survey as well. It's like, nice project. And yeah, so Ashley and Ralph, do you have like a similar uh, experience or how do you find a way to navigate through this if you already experienced similar things? <clears throat> Yeah, I, I, it's very relatable. I mean, just very recently, um, a company had approached me to say they were very interested in working with me. And um, 10 minutes into the conversation, it was like, uh, Rav, we hear what you're trying to do, but we need you to put together a business case. And I just found, you know, you, you approached me, now I have to build a business case and get it over to you for funding you know mm -hmm. and it, it was it was very difficult to to deal with that because why do women always have to build or we re keep rebuilding business cases every time um somebody is interested in their business and they and they want to work with them so um it, it's a difficult one to crack but i think you have to be very determined you can't back down i think you have to learn to tell your story in a very authentic way um somebody once said to me that you know if you're building a house at the top of the hill make sure that whoever you're talking to wants to run up that hill and wants to get into that house and they want to scream from the top of the roof of that house and tell everybody how great that house is so you have to find a great way of overcoming those challenges and barriers when you get into those conversations and learn how to turn them around. And luckily for me, I was able to turn this one around that I got an email a couple of days later saying, Rob, we want to work with you. We love your story and we'll invest. Um, so I, I just think it's, it, you have to persevere. And, and unfortunately, that's just the way it is at this moment in time. Thank you. Ashley, do you have a couple of more uh, sentences that you want to kind of uh, also share with our audience? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, mm -hmm. there's sort of like two different things I think going on here. This idea that women are branded as motherly or a bit too nice or all this kind of thing. Firstly, I mean, since when did being motherly become a derogatory term? <laughs> if someone says that you're motherly, surely you are someone who is absolutely smashing it because my understanding of what mothers do <laughs> You are running around, you are getting stuff done, you are organising, you're making sure everyone has what they need to do to be where they need to be at the right time. So that sounds like pretty good leadership skills to me. I don't know why that's derogatory. I'm like, get me a mum working on this stuff because I know she's going to get it done. <laughs> on the other side of things, um, with this idea of nice, yeah, it's, it is tough. It's a challenge. I mean, I, I have been in situations where you're kind of, it, I think it comes back into this not being taken seriously. That's a nice project. Oh, oh, good for you. Good for you exploring that little project. Um, that does happen. And I think it's because we aren't taken seriously. And maybe it's because, you know, as women, we're raised to be polite. We're raised to be self-deprecating. We're, you know, which actually in social situations, when you are leading a team, you're managing, being okay with listening to people and being okay with really wanting to make sure you're cultivating a positive 
you know, team focused culture, that's a, that's a part, it's a powerful skill, being able to make sure that people really are, you know, comfortable working together, they can talk to you, they're open, they feel listened to, they feel heard. That's really powerful, that's really important. I think where it becomes a challenge is knowing when you're allowed to stand up and say, actually, no, that's not okay, or feeling, feeling supported to do that. And I think that's where the struggle is. Whether you're a founder or not a founder, the workplace environment should be making it possible for women to turn around and say, no, that's not okay, or actually, this is my opinion, and not to be overlooked, ignored, assume that it doesn't matter, not validated, or, you know, you feel so scared that if you do say something, you might not have a role there anymore. I think that's the thing that needs to be addressed. Being the characteristics that you are, that's, that's you know, if you're good at your job and if you cultivate a great environment, that, that should all be fantastic. But, you know, we can't just bob women off with this thing that we've actually, as a system, asked them to be. We need to look at that system from the ground up. Thank you. Thank you for sharing with us. <clears throat> so we have another question, and I think this question is uh, very much for, for you, uh, Irene. He says, what can women founders do in order to close a successful funding round? So what's the number one thing, number one thing, that one thing um, that should work? On? So as an investor, um, you have that one thing that you feel um, founders, not just women in general, I think, um, can really work on and then, yeah, get it through. Yeah, I, I guess kind of like echoing a lot of the things that were kind of said today, I think, you know, depending on the stage of a company, if it's kind of pre seed stage, and therefore angel investors are the kind of key targets or a bit later stage <laughs> seed series A than focusing on uh, VCs, I think is funding uh, uh, who will be the sort of kind of, you know, lead investor for the round or, you know, the first few angels that are willing to write a check and kind of capitalizing mm -hmm. on that. Because, uh, I mean, as all the female founders on in this audience on the know, it's very hard to get to the first yes. And then once you get that, then it's much easier to get more yes, because unfortunately investors have much, you know, a lot of like kind of hurt mentality, you know, when, uh, a deal is hype, then you see, you know, everyone wants to jump on it. And at the moment, actually, the market is quite competitive um, and the companies have just raised a funding round, get already approached about the next funding round um, because investors want to get in quite early with, uh, you know, advanced subscription agreements, say, in, in advance of the kind of next round. Um, and I also think that, uh, you know, going back to the kind of, you know, newsletter, uh, keeping investors informed. I think, you know, a no is not like a permanent no. The, the reality, I think, of investors is that once, you know, when they use their, I guess, investment thesis or criteria, there are more things that they use to reject opportunities rather than accept them. Those change all the time, especially when, when they want to get into a deal and they've seen, you know, no's becoming yes and those yes becoming no. So I think, you know, don't uh, take no mm -hmm. for, uh, an answer, but then yes, focusing on really trying to incentivize early investors in. So if this is with, uh, you know, it's an angel round offering, you know, discounts with advanced subscription agreement as a way to kind of trying to uh, get commitment in, kind of get cash in. Also for sustainability uh, companies, is also quite good at looking at grant funding opportunity uh, because that's a way to actually get non-dilutive uh, funding in the business. Uh, you know, some businesses are more suitable than others, especially if you have a hardware-based business and using that to build the traction that that is needed to uh, speak to investors. Um, so this, but you know, I know it's it's not like easy, and that's it's you know going back to kind of persevering, uh, you know, learning from the no's, uh, or you know, thinking these are temporary no's. I'm going to, I still have, uh, uh, I can still change the mind of these uh, these people. That would be my kind of like main recommendation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so next question, and um, they asked. Um, we have talked about the value of networks and communities to support women in their business journey. So what are the best ways uh, you can suggest to assess this support? I'm going to take this question um, just to kind of um, do a bit of a um, marketing for uh, CISO's uh, accelerator program. So we very much um, try our best to support founders 
and um, especially if you are um, a startup that you have accessibility innovations the support in universities and um, not i believe not just cambridge university a lot of other universities also have a lot of resources sometimes it's really good um keep an eye on you know what's going on in this this place accelerator programs incubator programs sometimes you you just really need that first community, first group of you know people to help you through. And as you grow, you will carry on, build up, build out the community and networks. So as I mentioned uh, in the beginning of uh, the session, we have a Women in Sustainability Innovation Accelerator Program now currently open for education. So if uh, uh, you are listening and you have the innovation in this space, whether it's um, environmentally or socially that you are trying to help to support, please do um, go online, check CISO's website, check our accelerator. So I have a really good question that I keep it for the final moment as the closing part. So this question um, actually I was asked by someone who is not an investor and nor founder. Ask, <clears throat> what can women in the industry do to support the movement. So Zoe and Freddie, I would like to come to you too and kind of give us the, from, from your perspective, you know, as an educator, as well as a coach, I think this is a very uh, part, what can other women do to support the whole, you know, movement? Zoe, would you like to kick off this? Was that me? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, my, my thought on this, <laughs> And, and building on something that Rav said is build our ability to engage and inspire others. Uh, and for me, that is storytelling. It's it's what is your story? You know, what's the message that people are going to take away having had a conversation with you? How does that tap into the bigger why? What why should they care? What's in it for them? And just listen to others and just encourage stories that the truthful stories that drive transformational change and don't forget that we are telling a story before we even open our mouths so just continually you know improving you know what what that what that looks like so we are actually showing what change can be 100%. thank you so Freddie yeah and I'd, I'd add that in in many ways is that the biggest gift you can often give the world is is when you are so inspired by your own life and you always you can see people who are really inspired by their own lives and they've looked inwards they've found out what's really important to them they've prioritized their life around it and they've got a mission or a purpose or a vision that they're really living and they're living in service as well mm -hmm. and so i think being part of the movement in many ways is you looking inwards and being like what do i want to stand for who do i want to be and how am i going to create that in the world and so often you then create waves around you because you are you're so inspiring um and and we're in such an amazing point i think in history where we do have there's there's so much room for improvement but we do have so many more opportunities as women than we've ever had before and actually when you look at our ancestors and our grandparents and the opportunities they had access to they were tiny and so actually i just think it's an incredibly exciting time to be a woman and we have so many opportunities but we do also need to remember mm -hmm. to also bring up other women around us too so it's really that sense of yourself and your community and how you cultivate that thank you so much i think this is a, a high point for us to end this webinar and thank you very much for all our amazing speakers today and thank you for sharing you know your your thoughts insights with us and thank you for everyone that um, joined this session. So I put final slides. Um, if you would like to get in touch with us, this year, so it's a kind of your accelerator, there is an email and please feel free just to get in touch. And if you have any ideas you want to exchange with our panelists, I'm sure you will be able to find them on LinkedIn and reach out. So let's continue this movement all together. Thank you very much and goodbye. Bye everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.